Sorry we had some hiccups with the uh, internet this side and um, welcome to this uh, webinar today and um, I'm glad that there's the, the good number of people that have already responded to this and uh, today our interest uh, is on glaucoma and we want to thank the Uganda UK Health Alliance that has um, helped organize this in collaboration with the Macquarie University and uh, Mass and um, the ophthalmologist from within. Uh, we're really honored to have um, a team that is going to speak to us and uh, with the main interest of today being sharing best practices in glaucoma. We would like to hear from the uh, experience in Uganda and then the one in UK. Uh, we highly appreciate the Uganda UK Health Alliance, which is an umbrella body for UK institutions and organizations that are mainly involved in healthcare capacity building and whose main vision is to see that we have robust uh, health systems that are, in, that are well capacitated by the collaboration that we would have between Uganda and UK. And we highly appreciate the work that's done so far. Uh, last year they came over, they've been participating with us for some time, um, but last year they came over, there was a team of uh, specialists in retina and the oculoplastic that came to boost the services in, um, in those two fields. And we, we had an excellent time, we shared, um, there was a lot of sharing of experience and uh, exchange of knowledge and um, exchange of ideas and uh, we were blessed. Um, the main areas that were involved were Macquarie University, Mulago and uh, Raga Hospital. And there was a lot of um, gaining experience and uh, capacity that was built and skilled and enhanced in not only ophthalmologists but the other eye care workers with ophthalmologists like the nurses. And at the end of that meeting, we decided that we should have a continuum of this kind of activities and one of them was really to strengthen because it was like the first to show us the experiences that go on along the different sectors and so to see the gap and be able to see how this gap can be addressed. And one of the things that we agreed from that meeting was to continue training and, uh, and learning in different ways and one of them was to be the online training and then uh, webinars and all kinds of and, and continued uh, exchange of, of visits because we expect even to have a visit of people from this side to go the other end to have experiences in how things are done there and then vice versa. And this was most, most for faculty but also for those that are learning. And so we are happy to have this as one of the first um, uh, practices of what we had agreed to do. And uh, before us, we have two main speakers um, who are going to share their experiences. In Uganda, we have Dr. Ludo Tindewa, who is a, a virtual retinal surgeon, but who is well experienced in many other areas as well. And she has vast experience, has worked in uh, many uh, parts of Uganda. All right, uh, so Dr. Osama Giasin uh, is a consultant of pharmacologist from glaucoma, uh, who is also a glaucoma specialist working with Luton and Stable University Hospital. And uh, he has experience in uh, glaucoma and will be sharing with us uh, more about himself, but also more about how he's managing the glaucoma care on the other side. So those are the two main uh, speakers for the day and then we'll have a session of questions and answers and then we'll also hear from the um, nursing care of, of, of glaucoma and then we'll have our closing remarks by our president of the Uganda Ophthalmology Society, that is Dr. Simon Arunga, a consultant ophthalmologist and a clinical lecturer at Mambara University of Science and Technology. And he will give us the, the, the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Sorry for the hiccup of the technology.
No worries at all, Dr. Yeah. Anne. Yeah. Nice, so, nice to meet we... you all. Nice to meet you. Uh, Dr. Ludo, hi. Dr. Ludo? Hello? Hello? Yes, good to see you. Uh, uh, yeah, so we're going to start with you, Dr. Ludo, to give the experience of Uganda uh, in glaucoma care. Mm. Briefly talk about yourself and get on the pitch. Thank you. Okay. Um, can, I, uh, can I share my presentation? So in case of questions, you can be you can be sending them on the chat, and at the end of the day, we'll, at the end of the meeting, that's when we can address them. So please feel free to to, to send your comments, questions, compliments on the chat. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon. As as briefly introduced, I'm Dr. Ludo Tindiewa. A uh, consultant ophthalmologist working with Mengo Hospital. Um, I'm a VR surgeon as well. Uh, today I'm just to talk about uh, glaucoma in Uganda. And um, an overview of uh, glaucoma management in Uganda. So uh, briefly, uh, Glaucoma uh, is the third is, is the third cause of blindness in Uganda, contributing about six percent of blindness. So in Uganda, uh, glaucoma is managed by general ophthalmologists uh, who um, are distributed in about twenty hospitals. Uh, we have uh, ophthalmologists in ten government hospitals and in 10 private hospitals. And all these hospitals, of all these hospitals, 12 of them are located in Kampala. Uh, we have also OCOs, ophthalmic, those are ophthalmic clinical officers, who help us with the cleaning, clean screening of both district hospitals and in specialized clinics. Uh, at times, they also initiate treatment before referring patients to ophthalmologists. Uh, we do not really have glaucoma subspecialists, and we do not have uh, glaucoma specialized nurses. In terms of equipment, most hospitals can do slip lamp by microscopy. They can do a planation tonometry. A few hospitals use pulse air tonometers, and some units still use shears tonometers. Very few hospitals in Uganda have visual field machines, OCT, and fundus cameras. So generally, that's where we are. Now, how do we find cases here in Uganda? Uh, most of our patients actually work in hospitals uh, when they have poor vision or when they've lost vision or when they have pain. And some actually come looking for reading glasses. Very few people are found do, uh, during routine eye checkups. There are few people who actually are uh, go to hospitals to, to see how they stand. And some of those, we actually pick some cases. Uh, we also get referrals from units run by ophthalmic clinic officers and optometrists. Uh, we get referrals from eye community out, uh, outreach programs. We also get referrals from fellow ophthalmologists. So uh, I'm going to uh, list out the kind of glaucomas which you see here in Uganda and their common presentations. 
So uh, we get children with congenital glaucoma, both with and without anterior segment abnormalities. And they usually present in infancy, that's the first year of life. Usually brought in by caretakers or parents uh, when they are scared about uh, the book thermos and cloud deconias and photophobia. Uh, the second one we see, and which is the commonest, is open angle glaucoma. Uh, the primary open angle glaucomas uh, are the commonest, actually. It's the commonest type we see here. Uh, they normally come with poor vision or loss of vision or difficulties in reading. So sometimes uh, we find them accidentally during pandoscopy. The second very open angle glaucomas, uh, here they are commonly due to trauma. With the itis, we, we see some which are caused by pseudoexfoliation and corticosteroids. These are the common, uh, commonly associated uh, causes of secondary glaucomas here. Patients normally present with poor vision uh, with or without painful red eyes, depending on the cause. So the third category of glaucoma we see here is angle closure glaucoma. Uh, the primary acute type is rare, very rare. But a few cases we, we see they come in with headache, severe eye pain, and burning or loss of vision, uh, very short uh, duration. And here the eye, eye findings are usually very high intraocular pressure, coneidema with mild mid-dilated pupils and normal optic discs. Of course, you see the discs after you've done some treatment and the coneidema has subsided. Now, the chronic angle closure glaucoma is common, commoner than the uh, the primary acute one. And usually, these ones come in with a history of seeing colors around lights and blurring of vision at night or early in the morning. I suppose that's when they are awake in dim light. And then uh, they also report diminishing vision. Uh, here, usually, you find optic disc capping but with no more intraocular pressures. Actually, normally when we find such scenarios, uh, we normally go ahead and do gonioscopy to see if there are signs of angle closure, uh, like synechia or clumps of pigment. So um, angle closure glaucoma, we also see the secondary angle closure commonly due to dislocated natural lens. And most of these patients actually have had eye trauma. So the fourth type we see uh, is neovascular glaucoma. And this is usually associated with uh, retinal neovascular diseases like uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and uh, retinal vein occlusions. Um, Okay, now how do we manage these patients? The diagnosis, of course, you, you've got to listen very carefully uh, to the history because most of the time this gives a clue uh, to what type of glaucoma the patient may have. And uh, after getting the history, normally we do uh, examination and here we take visual acuity. Uh, we take intraocular pressure, uh, which may or may not be raised in the, uh, open angle glaucoma, but only is high in acute angle closure. We do slit lamp by microscopy, 
for both anterior and posterior segments. Conidema is common in acute angle closure glaucoma and neovascular glaucoma due to very high intraocular pressures. Uh, we look for the optic nerve changes, uh, which are usually not uh, present in acute angle uh, closure glaucoma, but capping is always uh, present in open angle glaucoma and is actually diagnostic. Uh, then we do documentation of the optic nerve, uh, usually by, uh, by the vertical cap disc ratio. Uh, usually when it's uh, greater than 0 0.5, it is suspicious of glaucoma. Uh, when uh, the, the cap is very deep and you have this bolamina cribrosa, suspicious of glaucoma, uh, when you see notches, this chemorrhages, bionetting vessels, and then inequalities in the cup disc ratios of the two eyes. These are some of the indications that uh, you are dealing with glaucoma. So open angle glaucoma and chronic uh, angle closure are diagnosed on optic nerve uh, damage, that is uh, capping. Other glaucoma investigations uh, or documentation methods now available here in Uganda. Uh, some units have do visual field tests. And especially if, if you have the facility, especially if you are um, doubting the, uh, uh, the optic disc appearance, then it's good to do a visual field. You also uh, need to do visual fields uh, as baseline for future monitoring of progression. Um, some units have OCT and the OCT of the optic nerve is very useful and it's actually, I think, the, the, the gold standard now. Uh, we, take all, we also take the vertical cup disc ratio of uh, greater than 0 0.5. Then uh, fundus photography can help in documentation. And uh, when you get a very high, when you get a high uh, intraocular pressure, it's a very, very important finding because it may be the cause of the glaucoma. And two, you know, uh, of all the factors associated with the glaucoma, it's the intraocular pressure uh, which is actually modifiable. It's actually what we treat when we are treating glaucoma most of the time. So, uh, Intraocular pressures should actually be very well attended to. Uh, gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is done actually to determine whether uh, to look at the angle characteristics and more especially if you want to distinguish the chronic angle glaucoma from the open angle glaucoma. Uh, of course, when you have angle closure, acute angle closure, it's very obvious that the angle is actually closed because you see this shadow AC and whatever. But if you have the chronic uh, angle closure glaucoma, it's very, very, uh, very important to do the mescopy. Um So now, uh, treatment, of open angle glaucoma here. How do we treat open angle glaucoma? Now, uh, first of all, after assessing the patient, what normally we start with is the optic disc capping. You look at it and grade it 
uh, using the cup disc ratio and uh, you set a target intraocular pressure which actually the pressure which you um, you think will actually minimize which is which will minimize uh, further damage from the glaucoma so that's the first step uh, as a guideline here where i work we, when you have a cup disc ratio of 0 0.8 to 1 we normally target uh, to achieve uh, an intraocular pressure of 15 millimeters of mercury and less. When the CD is actually 0 0.6 to 0 0.7, we target 18 and less. And when it is 0 0.5 or better, we target between 18 and 21 millimeters of mercury. So this being the starting point, whatever we will do, Whatever treatment we we'll undertake, will actually the reference is our target IOPs. The target IOPs are very very important uh, because it gives you um, like your your final uh, final destination when you are treating a specific patient, where you feel that I've done very well. It's a reference, and two, in case the patient is seen by someone else in future then they know uh, where the patient should actually go so it's very very important now after setting your target uh, intraocular pressure uh, then you go back to the measurement of the intraocular pressure which you got and depending on how much it is uh, you may choose the drugs or drug combinations that will push the intraocular pressure to your target. And this depends by this. Actually, you need to know the, the intraocular pressure lowering effect of the various drugs because there are some which can lower like up to around four millimeters, others do four to eight millimeters, others actually go up to around 14 millimeters. So uh, using that as a guide, you can play around with different drugs uh, so that you know, you push your pressure from where you, you started to where your target is. So here, um, Surgery is actually not a very, a very attractive to patients. So initially, uh, we start with the medical treatments, with eye drops, and maybe some tablets, depending on how high the pressure is. Then as we treat along, we do a lot of counseling and wooing the, the, the patients to actually undertake uh, surgery. Finally, when we patients that even with very expensive drugs you are not achieving the pressures you, you have you want uh, quite a number of patients actually accept surgery there are patients hey, actually doctor is a co-host ah. hello hello okay i can proceed Okay, uh, we find uh, normally those ones who fail to reach uh, the target pressures, those ones who default uh, on follow-ups, and those who find drugs very expensive. Then we have also these ones where you have glaucoma coexisting with cataracts. Uh, those are normally good targets for for. Uh, surgery. So currently, uh, we actually have uh, good stocks of drugs here. Uh, we have uh, the alpha agonists, we have beta adrenergic blockers, we have prostaglandin analogs, we have carbohydrate, uh, carbo carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. 
we it's not like years back when when we are very much limited so we have a very big um and a, a very big number of uh, actually drops to pick from uh glucoma surge procedures uh depend actually on the choice of surgeons as per individual success rate the commonest uh, procedure here is a trabeculectomy and uh, with units which can afford uh, five fluorouracil and mitomycin C, uh, we normally use them uh, during the surgeries. But of course, there are some units, especially the government units, some government units which don't have. I think those ones actually do without uh, these uh, drugs. Uh, some people with the uh, trabeculectomies, some do the conventional trabeculectomy, but there are others who actually do uh, trabeculectomies with multiple scleral flaps. Uh, also here, we, we combine uh, glaucoma and cataract surgeries a lot. A few units who, ha, who a few units actually do also uh, laser trabeculoplasties. So um, basically, that's how we actually manage what uh, the open angle glaucoma, and then we do the follow-ups. You do the follow-ups. When you've done surgeries and the follow uh, and you follow up, you've not reached your target, then you supplement uh, the surgeries with the eye drops. And uh, normally we get there. Sometimes even the trabeculec uh, the, the trabeculectomies sometimes may fail, and you get forced to to repeat. Uh, in another site, uh, but that is if the pressures are still very high and difficult to manage with the drugs. So um, during the follow-ups, sometimes you find progression, and if you find progression even after you've achieved your target pressure, then you should shift to a newer target pressure. So that's how we manage our uh, open angle glaucoma. So treatment of angle closure glaucoma. Yeah, there are acute cases uh, with high IOPs. Uh, it depends on what is available to the doctor who is handling it. Yeah, actually in some, uh, we have some manito. Uh, you can use manito. And those ones who cannot get access to manito, they use uh, acetazolamide uh, orally. And then when the pressures drop, uh, we normally use 2% uh, pilocarpine and then later plan for uh, periphery iridectomies, either YAG or surgical, depending on the facility. Uh, if the IOP was due to lens uh, displacement, Hello? Yes. Any problem? Okay, I'll move on. Uh, if the high uh, intraocular pressure was due to lens displacement, then you are ready to remove uh, the lens. Uh, that is a cataract surgery. If chronic angle glaucoma is without peripheral synechia, we do a, a peripheral reductomy. But if the synechia, then we drew a trabeculectomy. Now, uh, treatment of neovascular glaucoma. Uh, usually, uh, the intraocular pressures are very high. So we initially use acetazolamide uh, to reduce the intraocular pressure and topical antiglucomas, uh, especially those which suppress aqueous production. So when um, all 
okay, you need actually to, we normally actually handle the rebiosis in units where there is uh, a vastin. We normally give them some shots of uh, vastin. When the rebiosis actually disappears, then you can safely do a trabeculectomy. Uh, a few of us actually do also glaucoma drainage implants. So uh, when the eye has settled and you have a very good view of the retina, then you should actually do a PRP. We actually do the, the PRP so that the rhodiosis can regress. Um, the long-term results of trabeculectomy in neovascular glaucoma are not very good. The shunts actually do better. They are even worse if you don't handle the rhodiosis. Now, management of congenital glaucoma, we normally do an examination under anesthesia. Uh, here, we take intraocular uh, pressures using either shears or tonal pens. Uh, we measure corneal uh, diameters, do fundoscopy, and we document. Uh, so post, uh, after the examination under anesthesia, we normally control intraocular pressures with topical anti-glaucomas, usually beta blockers, and then plan for glaucoma surgery. Here, we commonly do trabeculectomies. Some units do goniotomies, but those are few. Um, post surgery, we actually monitor uh, the intraocular pressures regularly, like three, three monthly, and we do it for a long time. When uh, the trabeculectomies seem to have reduced uh, drainages, then we supplement uh, with uh, topical drugs, and sometimes we have repeated surgeries. Uh, in summary, uh, glaucoma management uh, is actually controlling the intraocular pressure to the level uh, where you minimize or prevent visual loss. Long term, many people actually lose vision, but uh, you can actually postpone this for many years. Uh, although there are general principles of management, uh, the clinician here actually normally makes uh, the intervention decisions as per the individual case uh, of the patient. With that, thank you very much for participation. This is actually what we have in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ludo. Um, I hope we have all noted down our questions because we'll not answer them now. We'll go straight on to Dr. Osama. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Ludovica, for the comprehensive presentation and the thorough presentation. It's uh, nice to have an insight on uh, glaucoma management and glaucoma services in Uganda. Um, uh, uh, first of all, my, uh, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Osama Giasin. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist in uh, uh, in the uh, UK for 14 years. I've been in UK for 14 years. Uh, in total, I, um, uh, I was based in Luton and Dunstable Hospital up until recently, and now I'm starting to uh, uh, develop some uh, artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, modules for um, glaucoma uh, management in the Greek islands. Uh, hopefully, that's my new project. Um, I did my uh, full training in the uh, UK from foundation into training and subspecialty in glaucoma uh, in Bristol Eye Hospital. And uh, I'm honored to be in this uh, nice group and uh, 
to share uh, the experience of glaucoma management services in in UK. I will uh, just explain about the structure of the glaucoma services, and uh, I will. Um, um, I think uh, we hopefully will have future uh, meetings and uh, uh, teachings about specific uh, sections of this presentation to talk about the clinical details and the more practical details, uh, depending on the audience, because we are hoping that we will have also optometrists involved as well and nurses and specialist nurses, hopefully. I have no financial interest in any of the products that you might see in here, and a lot of the images I borrowed from the internet for demonstration purposes. Uh, I will talk about the um, services in UK, starting from the screening uh, to primary care, secondary care, and then I will talk about the treatment and management options we have in UK, about the future uh, options that have already started appearing in the uh, UK. So glaucoma screening in the uh, UK, it's uh, one of the most uh, structured uh, uh, screening services in the world. Um, uh, I think it's from the uh, 70s at least. Um, in UK, glaucoma is usually picked up during a routine eye test from uh, a routine uh, optometrist uh, visit. Uh, and it's usually before any noticeable symptoms. It's an incidental finding from a routine eye test. We usually in UK, it's encouraged that someone has an eye test and at, at an optometrist out uh, in the street, um, uh, optometrist uh, practice every two years. Uh, higher risk uh, people uh, with glaucoma, for example, those who have a close relative with uh, glaucoma, uh, they might be advised to go more frequently by their optometrist. Uh, and as I said, these are done at an optician practice. Um, they have a lot of facilities as well, these uh, optician practices, and they are uh, funded to a great extent by uh, the government and uh, through, through various schemes. And a lot of people are entitled for a free eye test in the UK, and this, uh, this is a link to see who are the people entitled for free eye test. And it has to do with uh, age, and, if you, and these are just some points that people get free eye tests in the UK in uh, an optometrist or optician practice. And you can see that people who have been diagnosed, their children get, uh, uh, those who are diagnosed with glaucoma, their children uh, and siblings, they get uh, um, uh, screened and tests for free. The reason I'm mentioning this is because it's very important to have access uh, and easy and free access to uh, eye test uh, to detect glaucoma early. Um, there are nice guidelines for primary care providers, which in UK are optometrists, uh, GPs uh, with special interest in glaucoma, uh, general practitioners. Uh, they do an extra uh, training to be um, uh, to have a spe with, uh, to have an, um, a training in ophthalmology, and they are called uh, GPs with special interest and also with community optometrists. These are, those are the primary care providers in UK, and they do the routine eye test and the screenings and the follow-ups. Uh, there are nice guidelines that they can uh, advise them and, and guide them to what they should do when to refer a patient to secondary care, and um, um, they advise or it's recommended that uh, they follow a two-tier assessment better than a simple repeated measure. This means that the patient goes for a routine eye check, they want to see for new glasses, they have no symptoms for glaucoma, they don't know they have glaucoma, they just go for a routine eye check. Um, they do their refraction, they check their intraocular pressure, and they look, they do an anterior segment slit lamp examination. If and they take also a uh, clinical history. That's all done by these primary care health providers. And if they have, if they trigger based on an assessment tool, a risk stratification tool uh, published by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, they uh, follow some guidelines and they do, they go to a second tier assessment, which means they escalate in their local practice, they escalate their treat, their, their investigations. So they do uh, OCT and visual field, 
and um, a fundus photograph. That, those are available at uh, Common Street uh, Optician Practices. And then, based on the risk certification system and various schemes available, they are referred to secondary care, either for primary open angle glaucoma or narrow angles uh, glaucoma or without glaucoma, or just for ocular hypertension or for suspicious disc appearance. They don't make diagnosis, uh, although most of the time their referrals are quite spot on, uh, but sometimes it's just for reassurance and for a specialist uh, input. I put the links here, you can uh, log in, uh, you can go straight away to these links and uh, read through the guidelines and the risk certification tool. And this is just a snapshot or a print screen uh, of this, uh, st this certification tool, for example. And you can see they take into consideration the patient's age, um, visual field, um, um, if there is any evidence of uh, progression, if they are known to have glaucoma, because they also they carry on with their routine and eye check, even if they have a follow-up at the hospital for their glaucoma. The optician uh, or the primary eye care provider, they have to check for these things as well, because as any other system, it has gaps and the patient may fall through their follow-up period and they lose their follow-up for various reasons, either from personal circumstances, so the patient might have other illnesses, or from hospital uh, factors, for example, uh, the clinic get, gets cancelled. So we still advise that these patients, even though they have uh, secondary care follow-ups and appointments, they still carry on with their um, routine eye check at the optician. Now, in primary care, and I meant by primary care, um, emergency departments, the general emergency department uh, in NHS hospital, or uh, specifically eye casualty, which is the eye emergency clinic. It's a specialist uh, place in the eye department, in every department. Almost in the UK, they have an eye casualty. It's run by uh, trainees usually and supervised by a consultant. Uh, patients can go into this uh, clinic either from optician referrals if they are if they want an urgent appointment for that patient who had been seen in the primary uh, uh, eye care providers uh, practices, or sometimes patients who have known to have other eye problems, they can call uh, a triage nurse and get referred. Sometimes if it's out of hours and they have an emergency or a burning concern, they do go to the accident and emergency department and they get assessed by the emergency doctors, and depending on their assessment, they refer them to uh, the appropriate uh, clinic, either the eye casualty or into the glaucoma specialist clinic. Uh, these cases usually are acute angle closure glaucoma. Uh, they present, as uh, my colleague mentioned, with uh, severe ocular and periocular pain with quick and sudden loss of uh, vision uh, with uh, corneal edema on examination, mid dilated pupil, and they have very high uh, intraocular pressures and they require uh, immediate management to save their sight, basically. Uh, of course, other emergencies they present to a &E or the eye casualty, uh, either directly or from uh, urgent referrals, uh, usually they are um, the same in. Um, in Uganda probably, either from trauma, uveitis, or um, it's very rare in UK, but you can still see some phacolytic, for example, phacolytic glaucomas. Uh, and sometimes other incidental findings uh, that patients come to the eye casualty for, other, for something else, for example, they come for uh, shingles, or they come for um, some drop allergy, that they developed from their glaucoma drops, they stopped using their glaucoma drops, their pressure comes up, and they pay, you pick up that their pressures are out of control and their appointment for follow-up are way down the line, uh, and it's not any time soon. And these also, they get picked up in those um, eye casualty clinics. In secondary care, which is the consultant ophthalmologist, and the ophthalmologist usually um, work in the glaucoma services, 
um, they uh, see patients uh, or we see patients in these clinics um, either new referrals or follow-ups. Um, the structure of the clinic, it's a glaucoma consultant-led clinic, so a consultant, all the patients are under the supervision of uh, this uh, consultant. Uh, it has a team of uh, trainees, junior doctors, and junior doctors in UK, that could be someone who has up to seven years of uh, glaucoma training experience, some of them, or sorry, uh, ophthalmology experience, and that's a training program, uh, it's uh, seven years, as well as fellows. So the fellows, they finish their training and they have one or two years of post-training, specialist training in, in glaucoma. So all these people, as well as optometrists or orthoptists, uh, who have been trained in glaucoma and they have specific qualifications and training. Um, and in UK, there are a lot of online modules that they could um, give an optometrist or uh, an orthoptist um, have some specialist training in these areas. And we actually, I was, uh, I launched with uh, another professor, a uh, pioneer module for clinical optometry uh, and online. That was a few years ago, and uh, it's still running. Uh, so, and now with the coronavirus, a lot of online modules are coming up. So it's a good opportunity for any optometrist in the audience or orthoptist or specialist nurses to uh, maybe uh, get funded or have access to these modules and get certified. It's always an important skill, especially in uh, community and rural areas. Uh, in, we have these optometrists in the hospital as well, and uh, specialist nurses, and they are all part of the glaucoma clinic team. And we do these basic investigations for new referrals. So these are the new referrals who came and been referred from the primary eye care providers, community optometrists, GPs with special interest, or uh, community orthoptists. Uh, for every patient, for every new case, in my clinic, I personally uh, request all of these. I'm quite fortunate in my hospital, and I think in most UK hospitals, if not all, these are all readily available, and they are basic routine uh, investigations that they are done for every new referral. They get their visual acuity measured. Uh, you get from them full detailed history uh, with their medications, past medical history, past ocular history and procedures social circumstances, whether they live alone, whether they have someone who lives with them, and what medications they take, if they have been started on new medications, uh, etc. if they had recent hospitalizations, um, because all these factors, they are important uh, to understand the, the case and to design the management afterwards. Uh, full clinical examination front to back is a must, at least once at the first referral. And that should include dilated fundus examination, if it is appropriate, of course. So you have to do gonioscopy for every first case uh, in UK uh, to assess the angle and as a baseline. And then if it's all safe, you dilate the fundus and do full dilated fundus examination because you need to visualize in 3D vision the optic disc and to do a full assessment of the optic disc. Um, of course, you do the glaucoma, the, sorry, the gold banana plantation tonometry. Um, we do sometimes do um, uh, rebound tonometry or uh, with tonopin, but the gold standard is, is gold banana plantation tono or aplanation tonometry. Um, but if some patients, they are of poor mobility, for example, or they are not cooperative, we can try with other methods such as rebound tonometry, which is eye care, for, as an example. Um, uh, we measure for every case, uh, we need to have a central corneal thickness or a pachymetry. And that's important for diagnosis and designing and deciding the target pressure. So as my colleague mentioned, the target pressure is essential. And that is based on intraocular pressure, age, and central corneal thickness. There are guidelines. Um, uh, from the Royal College and you can access them to decide and that basically classifies people or glaucoma suspect patients, ocular hypertension patients and normal tension glaucoma patients into their categories um, and that gives you the definite 
Dr. Yes, please. Dr. Sama, sorry to interrupt. It's just to let the people, members know that uh, because of the technical issues we got, our, our, our meeting is extended by 25 to 30 more minutes. No problems. I will try to be as quick as possible as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. uh, very, very exciting to meet you all. So I will try to be concise as well. Okay. okay. I know people have commitments as well. Thank you. No worries. Um, so we do central cornea thickness. We, uh, every new case gets uh, a threshold uh, visual field test in, in, I think, as far as I know, in almost all UK hospitals are Humphrey visual field test using 24-2. You can design, you can change that, uh, but usually 24-2 threshold test CETA uh, or CETA fast, depending on the patient as well as they are uh, not very cooperative. Uh, we do a disc OCT for every patient to decide the baseline retinal nerve fiber layer. And we sometimes also do a 3D optic nerve head uh, photography. That's for every new referral patient in almost all um, UK hospitals. Follow-up uh, patients, they depend on the case. Uh, they could be post-op follow-ups or post-procedures such as laser, et cetera. Uh, there are also the routine follow-ups which they get, you decide in your initial assessment clinic what is required in the next follow-up. Whether it's a repeat visual field, we tend to repeat visual fields six to 12 months uh, appointments uh, to repeat them uh, to monitor their progression alongside with an OCT. Of course, um, I know it sounds all luxurious, but we do also have limitations and uh, it's quite busy. So we try to modify depending on case basis and stability of the glaucoma for that patient. Um, we have designed also in UK for a long time uh, virtual clinics. So patients, they go, uh, there are certain guidelines. This link on the in the presentation takes you to the guidelines uh, from the Royal College to do virtual clinics. So you do all the tests required by a nurse practitioner, specialist nurse practitioner, or an optician. And then you do all these tests, for example, visual acuity, intraocular pressure, corneal thickness, these images and these tests, they get reviewed by an ophthalmologist, usually a consultant uh, glaucoma ophthalmologist. And these are usually for stable cases uh, and um, or ocular hypertension cases, for example, or glaucoma suspects. Uh, treatment, uh, as my colleague mentioned, uh, medical treatment, laser treatment and surgical treatment. We always start with monotherapy in UK and then depending on the consultant or the glaucoma specialist, we either switch or add on. And that's always an area of uh, debate and, uh, um, and it's usually based on the consultant preference. Uh, laser treatments, we have uh, YAG laser peripheral hydrotomy for narrow angles. We do them a lot in narrow angles, even if they don't have an acute angle glaucoma or they don't have glaucoma at all, they just prophylaxis. Uh, we do YAG SLT laser uh, for, uh, as a primary treatment for primary open angle glaucoma or as an alternative if the patient doesn't follow or cannot be compliant with the drops or as an enhancement, as an add-on to achieve the target pressure. Uh, we have cyclodiode laser for certain cases, for example, uh, neovascular glaucoma and blind eye. Um, there are various indications uh, for cyclodiode laser. We use also PRP laser for proliferative glaucoma alongside with anti-VEGF treatments, as my colleague mentioned. Uh, surgical treatments in UK, uh, the same as in Uganda, and um, as far as I'm aware, in most of the world, the primary surgical treatment is trabeculectomy, and it's the most common uh, uh, treatment. And that's, sorry, uh, that's with uh, an anti-scarring, anti-metabolite agent. MMC in UK is a gold standard, but recently we had an issue with MMC availability. So we used the FIFU and we started reading again about uh, using FIFU with trabeculectomies. Surgically, we use tubes, uh, implant devices such as Ahmed valve or Multino or Bevel valves. These are the most common valves uh, or tubes used, uh, valved or unvalved tubes we use in UK. And recently, we have the micro-incision glaucoma surgery with the mixed devices. Um, so that's just a quick summary, the drops, the normal drops. We have all the 
the groups, uh, prostaglandin analogs, beta blocker, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, alpha agonists. We don't use myotics much. We only use them to prepare patients for uh, PIs probably or, or trabeculectomy. Uh, this is SLT laser. It's a YAG laser. And uh, we do, uh, after the light study now, we use it as a primary option. We offer it to the patient as a primary treatment. And that's obviously designed and decided between the doctor and the patient based on their uh, clinical and social needs. Uh, trabeculectomy, as my colleague mentioned, uh, I'm not going to talk about it. I think my colleague covered it quite well. Um, it's a commonest uh, glaucoma surgery in UK as well. These are surgical devices. I think this, uh, this drawing and diagram is for uh, Maltine, I think, or a bevel, but it's non-valved. Uh, Amid valve is a tube that is a valved uh, procedure. Both are uh, commonly used in UK, and they are used for neovascular glaucoma um, or um, certain uh, groups of patients, such as ubiotics, for example. Um, it's 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 uh, we, we can talk about it in diff in next meetings, hopefully, uh, for surgical glaucoma. Um, Mix the microincision glaucoma surgery. It's a, it's a quite a, a getting more and more um, use and attention in in UK. Uh, the most common that I have experienced as well myself is eye stent and Zen implants. There are different options and various options. These are the uh, this is the eye stent, uh, and this is this is basically the smallest uh, implant in the human body that's been invented so far, as far as I know. And you can see how small it is. Uh, looking at uh, the right, uh, oh, sorry, the left side of the picture of the screen, and you, and that's a clinical picture as well. Uh, you have also the Zen implant, which is a gel uh, porcine implant. Um, the, recently, we started using MMC with it uh, to uh, prevent the scarring under the bleb that's created by this implant. It's an ab interno, uh, so in theory, you uh, minimize the uh, uh, the bleb creation uh, uh, complications and the uh, scarring and fa factors that uh, are produced from the surgery. And that's the size of the Zen implant gel. Uh, and future uh, uh, prospects uh, nowadays with COVID-19, it has boosted up the int uh, interest in artificial intelligence uh, with a lot of modules that they give you diagnosis only with Picture. So you take a disc photograph, a disc OCT, a bit of clinical history, and it gives you immediate diagnosis and some of the modules they can suggest um, uh, treatments. Uh, they are quite promising and there is a, quite an active research. I think Uganda as well is probably could benefit a lot from this uh, in a way that you can attract investments from companies like Google Health and uh, IBM and other uh, health, um, IT health uh, organizations and companies that they look to invest in large populations uh, to, um, to and in, in that way you can attract indirect investments to have uh, OCTs and uh, fundus images and other uh, m very advanced glaucoma uh, assessment uh, devices. Uh, on return, they can share the images and do some um, artificial intelligence training for these uh, for these machines. Uh, obviously, that's something we can always talk and do a presentation about it. Teleclinics and telemedicine nowadays as well, it's something ongoing uh, to triage patients and also make sure they are okay. Um, there is guidelines as well in the from the Royal College about the teleclinics specifically for glaucoma. In conclusion, um, uh, between 2015 and 2035, the number of people living with glaucoma in the UK is expected to increase by 44%. So it is a big problem as well in the UK um, due to the aging population and due to many other factors that are common globally. Uh, glaucoma management, in my opinion, it requires a well-structured system. Glaucoma management is not just a medication, it's not just a surgery. It requires a system, a well-structured system that takes into consideration the demographics of that place or country and the economics of the healthcare system. 
because you may not have a lot of facilities, but you can amend them and put a structure to it um, to screen, pick up cases before they are advanced and provide them the appropriate treatment based on their social circumstances. In a recent trip in India, they go quite at a very low threshold to operate on many patients, where in UK we may not operate. And I couldn't understand initially why you don't give them treatment, but then when you look at the social circumstances, uh, they may need, some patients, they may need to walk for two hours or two days to reach the nearest hospital. So they offer them surgery as a first line because this patient may not be able to come back. They come, they travel for long distances, they stay in that hospital or around that hospital for a week or few days or depends on what their social circumstances allow and they have that only visit they cannot come back again maybe in a year's time so designing a good structured services in my opinion is a crucial regardless of the economics um, or take into consideration the economics and the resources and the demographics available uh, and as I said, Uganda uh, could attract, um, like India did with artificial intelligence, could attract these big companies and they could provide uh, these up-to-date uh, diagnostic devices like OCT and 3D images and um, be a good area like India did um, with uh, Google Health and the Arab Institution, for example, and uh, share, you know, uh, the, speci the special characteristics of the Uganda patients uh, with, the, with the world as well. So that's me. Sorry for the delay. Uh, I get carried out. Uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to have any questions or any discussion. I read a lot of the questions. I think we can answer them individually at future meetings or uh, if uh, you know, I'm happy to share my slides, um, or I'm happy if anyone wants to contact me or um, send me an email. I can provide my email. I think Simon has my email. By all means, I'm happy to share it with anyone. Thank you very Thank much, you. Um, Sir Osano. It's great that you precisely put it, and uh, it's very informative and. Uh, be sure this is just the beginning. We are going to interact much more and uh, you'll be getting more of these uh, back and forth kind of uh, links so that we can get better. I'm sure everyone would like to have your email and all these two uh, further questions that we we'll be having along just a limit of time that won't allow us to get deeper into that. Uh, I'll be asked already. I hope you're still sending in your questions through the chat. Um, we are very, very also honored to have someone from Nigeria, Dr. Fatma Kairi, who will be telling us some, some information from Nigeria. She's a glaucoma specialist, a consultant of pharmacy. Dr. Simon will probably introduce her better. Um, she will be coming on to tell us more. But just what I didn't want us to miss is that through the link for us in Nigeria University, we had an ophthalmologist who had uh, some good enough training and went to the UK and came back and has been having a national clinic of glaucoma. Unfortunately, she had to move to another facility and that broke down the sequence. But um, also on this uh, forum, we have some optometrists. Um, for those who didn't know, we have some optometrists in this forum or uh, in this meeting who have been having one observatory and um, I'm happy and I'm sure they're, they're, they're glad to be here and I think we will eventually have a good comprehensive kind of team that manages the glaucoma as we get along. In the past we didn't have people training in optometry but we have some of the training and we also have osteos and nurses that are uh, in the interest of uh, glaucoma. We have a, a nurse in, uh, in our eye clinic that has trained in glaucoma and can actually every manager the, the corner patients that come in and follow them up. Uh, thank you so much. I think over to you, Dr. Simon, to introduce to us the partner Kylie. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. 
I am uh, Plif Fatima Kiari. Uh, she is an associate professor with the International Center of Eye Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she is also based in Nigeria. And uh, Dr. Fatima has um, done a lot of work on glaucoma. Her PhD uh, basically described the epidemiology of glaucoma in Nigeria. And she continues to lead a group of uh, African specialists on glaucoma. Now, Fatima is going to be telling us about uh, uh, African toolkit uh, for glaucoma. Uh, Fatima, you're most welcome. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Simon, for that introduction. Um, thank you, Marcia, for putting me in the loop of this very important meeting. Uh, it's, it's actually a delight to be here and very interesting hearing about um, the Uganda and the UK glaucoma care program. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure meeting some of the Ugandan friends, even if it's virtual. But as you know, I know Simon very well, um, a friend from ICH whom I have very great admiration for his remarkable work in eye health. Um, Marcia and Nick are also here from ICH. Thank you. I'd also like to extend my appreciation to the Uganda-UK Health Alliance. Um, so as, um, the, as um, Simon mentioned, I am also a consultant ophthalmologist at University of Abuja Teaching Hospital. I, I am really just um, here to like to share with you um, okay, I'm just trying to see. Can I share my slide, please? All right, there we are. Can okay. you see? Brilliant. Okay. Yeah, we can yes. see. So okay. it's actually yeah. just a few minutes. Uh -huh. um, I think what we'd really like to do, you know, is to shift the paradigm to recognize that glaucoma blindness is avoidable in Africa. And one of the three main ways of doing this is to strengthen clinical services. Um, then earlier detection of glaucoma. You know, because we need to strengthen clinical services, even though the epidemiology shows that only 5% of people with glaucoma come to the hospitals, but we would like to give the best to that 5% that comes to the hospital. And then we need to strengthen health systems governance. Um, basically, in the last few years, after my PhD, I've been involved in two main programs. One is the development of the Glaucoma Management Toolkit and Guidelines for Africa, um, spearheaded by Light for the World. And um, while we were at that, the Keep Sight program for sight savers also came on board. And um, as you can see, these are the things that they wanted to do. Glaucoma subspecialty fellowships and surgical training. We have some um, doctors already on that. Glaucoma equipment, um, procurement. Um, we've been talking a lot to glaucoma um, equipment manufacturers and see how, seeing how we can make the equipment more universally available in Africa and at a very, you know, you know um, good cost. Um, then building up teams. So with the, the Cape Site project in, uh, for Site Savers, they're piloting it in Nigeria phase one and they're going to expand to other African countries and the, the interesting thing is what they're working on really is how do we get the coma patients from the community to the hospital at an earlier stage. So collaborations is very important. Um, the toolkit, which is just in its final stages, it's been in its final stages, but you know, things go back and forth. Um, and then COVID happened. So, but basically this is what we want to have, a, a structure so that we can apply to all our individual, you know, different systems that can help. So the first thing is how do we reach a diagnosis? There's a checklist to facilitate diagnosis. How do you choose your treatment? So there's a stage and risk calculator. And how do we choose the management? What are the management decisions we make? So in open angle glaucoma, what do we do? In angle closure glaucoma, what will we do? I'll show you an example in a, in a few minutes. Then um, the procedures, 
So you want to do a trabeculectomy, for example. Yes, you do know how to do a trabeculectomy, but we would like to link you to a place where you can study it and you know do trabeculectomy safely. Or even if you just want to do a gonioscopy, where can you get that information to do a gonioscopy nicely and well? Um, or, or newer techniques like SLT or MIGS, where will you find information on how to do it? And then what is the current opinion on 